Well, welcome everybody. Uh, today is a little bit of a role reversal. Uh, today I'm in the hot seat. I'm Paul. I'm uh, Paul Ingram. I'm Head of Global Operations here in the Spartans Boxing Club. And I work directly under our CEO, who today I have the uh, privilege of interviewing. Uh, Russell Harrison. Privilege. <laughs> privilege. Yeah, role reversal. So I'm going to try and remind myself that um, this is your show and I'm not going to try and take over. But what I will say before we kick off is I had um, some special preparation for this. Yeah. Um, and I was listening to Joe Rogan uh, with Ric Flair oh, <laughs> as yeah. his guest. Yeah. And so I'm just going to put that out there. That's been my inspiration for what we're going to do today. Okay. It's going to be up there with Rogan and Ric Flair. All right. Okay. Well, I know you've had an eventful life. I'm sure Ric Flair's had an eventful life. Joe Rogan's had an eventful life. So you're in good so company. So you. There you go. So good company. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to for not only the business, but the wider community to get to know Russell Harrison, the person. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, it is a privilege because it's an opportunity for me to ask you questions that I don't uh, get to ask on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, look, I thought we'd start with going right, right back. You know, where did you grow up? Where are you? I mean, we know you've got an Australian accent, but tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Yep, okay. Um, so, I'm, I'm Aussie. Um, so, I grew up in um, Melbourne, in Australia. Um, but I grew up in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. So, there's a couple of areas there called Preston and Reservoir. So if any of my friends from Preston and Reservoir are watching, represent, I love that. Um, and, and that area, it, it's a working class area. It was rough and tumble. Um, you know, most people that I grew up with, um, they weren't going to get university education and stuff like that. Like it was a work, working class suburbs, basically. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you, you've, you've started with that. You've thrown that out straight away. Is that something that has really shaped you? And shapes your thinking. Uh, absolutely. I just want to jump in here. It's because Paul's a psychologist, which everybody knows, and I kind of, <laughs> I, I, I feel like, you're you on, know, I feel like I'm on, on the couch. couch. <laughs> Should I face over here? And, well, yeah, uh, well, is that yeah. the right the right methodology? I'll be asking about your dreams very shortly. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. So look, it, I think for me that absolutely does shape. Um, it shaped a lot of things for me. I guess it shaped a lot of the things that I've done. It shapes a lot of the, the ways that I think. Um, and also, there was a period of my life where um, I, I sort of didn't start my story by talking about where I come from. Right. You know, my dad's a truck driver, my mum's a teacher, um, good, good middle-class working people. Um, but I guess sort of growing up, and when I started to move out of that area and go to uni and all that sort of stuff, that was maybe a part of my story that I was less proud of. Um, but as you sort of get older, you realise that um, you know all of the experiences that you've had. And for me, like growing up, working class, great family, and uh, you know really caring, loving family, and all of that sort of stuff. But it's definitely you know a big part of my story. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So. So you're growing up in, in these areas. So sports, obviously, a big part of that. What were the what were the first sports that you played, and how old were you? So, funnily enough, um, my mum wasn't huge on me getting into sports very young. So I didn't do what most Aussie kids do, and I didn't play football or cricket, which are kind of the key yeah. key sports, at least in in the south. Um, so I wasn't really allowed to do those sports when I was younger um, and, and I got put into I guess what then was considered to be a little bit more of um, a left field sport when I was young just again I'm on the couch um, <laughs> you know I was I was a bad tempered kid right um, I was pretty hot-headed I was pretty active um, and so my parents thought that the best sport for me to do first would be martial arts so, from the get go. From the get go. Right. So, first, how old are you at this time? Eight years. Eight, eight, years, eight old. years old. Yeah. So my parents put me into uh, martial <coughs> arts. The style of martial arts that I did, it was called um, Australian Freestyle Combat Karate. Right. Um, and this was in like 1988. Um, and 
that was although they called it karate if it had a name today it would kind of it would be called mma i guess so it was a combination of boxing muay thai jiu-jitsu wrestling as well as um some weapons stuff as well so um carly Eskrima, the filipino stick fighting um and they sort of amalgamated all of that into to one style but they taught it and I, you know this is huge in terms of what we do now with our Spartans kids program but also yep. in terms of like I guess how I sort of progressed through the sport it was taught with the same values of any martial art being inculcated into you know discipline and respect and hard work and all of that sort of stuff so that was my that was my first sport my first real sport that I got put into was martial arts and and how many eight-year-olds uh, get thrown into that so how many were in your cohort of eight-year-old kids that's a really good question. I mean, they, 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 at that stage in the 80s in Australia, you know, karate was, you know, starting to build some momentum. I can't remember what year the Karate Kid came out, right. maybe 86, if I remember correctly. So those sorts of sports were building momentum. So there was a group of kids, but it was by no means like, you know, a footy club would have 30 or 40 eight-year-olds. We maybe had four or five. Okay. Right, so it was it was smaller cohorts, but there was, you know, I was doing it. My sister, who was two years older than me, we started at exactly the same time. Um, so she was doing it, and then there's a bunch of other kids who we all became very good friends with over the years um, who who kept doing it. Yeah. Did you stay? Have you stayed in touch with any of the? I haven't stayed in touch. That's a good question. I haven't stayed in touch with um, with the kids. Yeah. Good idea, actually. I mean, Facebook now. That's what I do after this. I'll start. I haven't stayed in contact with with many of the kids. Um, I've got a buddy of mine who we originally met through footy, and then later on we were in the same martial arts school, and we're still friends to this day. So that's like you know, thirty five years later. Yeah. Um, but I, what I have done is there's a guy. Um, his name is Mick Nichols, so anybody in and around the sort of combat sports scene in Australia will typically know Mick. Um, I've reached out to him a few times over the years just to say, you know, thanks. All right. Yeah, because it was a really positive thing for me to do. So when, you, when your mum says, okay, Russ, this is... Does your mum call you Russ or Russell? Russ. Russ. So, yeah. so when your mum says to you, okay, Russ... Um, we're gonna, you're gonna go into this. Yeah. Did you have any idea what it was? Was it her decision? Was it your decision? Who was, who was pulling the strings there? That's a fantastic question. I'll tell you what I thought was gonna happen when I learnt to do martial arts. I thought that I'd be able to do backflips off the monkey bars. Right. Right. I had this really fanciful idea that you know I was gonna become a ninja. Yeah, basically that was what I thought. But I think if I remember correctly, and I can't remember all the details, it, um, we were given a couple of options of like what we wanted to do, and you know we went along and we tried a couple of things. Right. I um, mean, it just. So what else did you try? Ballet. <laughs> I didn't try ballet. No, uh, I can't remember. It, it, but it was a few martial arts. Like it might have been, I don't know, it might have been taekwondo or, or whatever else. But yeah. that was the one that we we ended up sticking to. So my idea of what I thought that it was going to be and what it turned out to be. Um, was very different. And so how long did you stay with them? So I did, that was my first style, and I did that for about eight years. Eight years? Eight years. So eight to 16. Yeah. Basically all through high school? All, all through, and it was, it was like I said, it wasn't like a popular sport. Yeah. So it was kind of weird that you, would, that you were doing that as a sport. Um, but it was great because, you know, I, I ended up uh, achieving my second degree black belt. Right. Um, I was an instructor at the age of 11. Right. So I was, you know, a black belt and I was teaching adults cool. from the age of 11, which I also think, you know, I learned a lot of leadership qualities um, from, from that experience. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think I, I kept going with that, yeah, until I was about 16. Um, but before that, I'd also started doing the more typical sports. Right. So I was playing footy and cricket. Um, so how many days you, how many days were you training during that period? Um, so when it was just the martial arts alone, um, it was I would have done three days of karate. Yeah. So I think Monday, Wednesday, and maybe one weekend day at the start, and then 
footy and cricket were school sports first. That's how I got into those sports. So I was playing them at school. Yeah. So training was whenever at school. And then I think I started playing cricket when I was 11, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's gone back a while. Yeah, right? that's great. Yeah. Um, I, cricket, I think I started playing first. Yeah. And then I started playing footy for a club um, when I started high school. So that would have been when I was 13. So then the combination of footy or cricket, depending on whether it was summer or winter, um, plus uh, karate, I would have been, you know, I would have been training one form or another at least four or five days a week. Wow. Yeah. And did, and did you have any competitions in that style or who did you compete? Because yeah. was there many other Australian combat places or were you competing with other martial arts? Yeah, um, and again, memory might test me a little bit here, but so I, I started competing in martial arts from a very young age, right. like from maybe 10 years right. old. Um, and there was internal tournaments. So the style that I was a part of they had multiple dojos, yeah. so you'd sort of come together and you'd do internal tournaments and compete against yeah. each other. And then there were other styles, so we'd go out and compete against, like in bigger tournaments, against other styles as well. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think much of it then, but was that full contact? Uh, at, initially, it wasn't full contact, and then sort of as you progress, like as you get to black belt and yeah. stuff like that, then it would become full contact. Right. Gradings were semi or full contact. Yeah. Um, so I didn't think about it much at the time then, but it was um, uh, it was a pretty uh, what's the best way to describe it? Like you just did it then, but yeah. later on you look back and you go, wow, that was pretty. You know, for kids to be doing that kind of stuff at that age, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty testing. Yeah. You learn a bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, and also one of the other things that was interesting was, um, you know, I had a couple of really obscure tournaments as well. Like I fought in a couple of um, Kalia Screamer stick fighting competitions as well. Right. Um, which again, you know, I just did it because. Um, so yeah, so I've been competing for years. And one of the things which only happened to me very recently was um, when I was young, I won a bunch of trophies. Like, you know, we, I, was the, I was a sporty kid. I had heaps of trophies and in our lounge room in our house where we grew up, my mum just had the trophies everywhere. Like they were on top of the mantelpiece, on the curtains, they were over the fireplace. Yeah. You know, you'd go into one of the bed. Like there was trophies everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why, but when I was moving house later on in life, like I'm going to say like maybe mid-20s or something, yeah. my mum said, what do you want to do with all these trophies? And I said, just get rid of them. Right? And um, so she, she chucked them all away. Right. And then only recently, because Fash and I got our own place and we've got the study, and you know I wanted to set up a trophy room of all of my stuff and all of her stuff, and called my mum and I said, whatever happened to those trophies? She said, you told me to throw them away. Oh, no. So yeah, if you're at home and you've got trophies <laughs> as a kid, don't, don't throw them away. I also gave away my, um, my black belt. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So just all stuff that I did at a point in time. There's a story life. there. What was the... I can't remember who I gave it to. Oh, okay. I can't remember, but I gave, yeah, I gave it away. And it was just one of those things where I was like, all right, I'm done with that. M move on. Move on. Yeah. Close that chapter. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no. Yeah, so anyways. Gee, the psychologist is just ticking it yeah, all over Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. I, I really feel <laughs> like after this, you're going to come back and you're going to say, so you said. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so you were also doing some other sports. Were you accomplished in those as well? So this is the cricket. Yeah. And when you say footy, we're talking Australian Aussie football. Rules, yeah. Oh, Aussie rules. Yeah. So I started cricket first, um, and I ended up playing competitive, sorry, representative cricket at regional level. Yeah. For cricket, but that was only in juniors, right? So it's not not really anything to write home about. Were you a batter or a bowler? I was a wicket keeper. Okay. Yeah. Wicket keeper. Back to bat. I could bat a little bit, um, but I quit. I mean, cricket was, um, when did I quit that? I think I, like, properly playing cricket, like, thinking I was going to get somewhere. I think, like, maybe late teens. Yeah. Um, but I was I was pretty accomplished in cricket. Um, footy was my thing. AFL footy was what I 
really wanted to do. Right. And so um, I was pretty good at football as well. Um, had played sort of regional representative football as well. Were you quite quick as a runner? I was quick. Yeah. Um, I still am quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I was I was fast. I was small. Um, I was relatively skillful, but mostly I was known for being hard. Right. I was, um, you know, for anybody that knows AFL football, there's the guys that get in and under and get the hard balls. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was more well known for was being a hard ball player. And I had more concussions from AFL football than I had from any other sport combined, including boxing. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Um, but the, the, the heartbreaking part of the, the AFL story is so, you know, when I was a kid, if you went into my room, I had just, you know, there's posters of AFL, I was obsessed. I used to sleep with my footy. Right. Right, that's how, and if you saw me walking down the street, there was always a football in my hand. I thought I was really going somewhere with that. Yeah. And in the end, I was just too short. Right, yeah, I, was, <laughs> I, was just too short. Obvious. I was just too short. Yeah. yeah, it's a tall man's game, right? It's a tall man's game. So you need to be, you know, six foot athlete, yeah. um, and they weren't necessarily concerned as much about your hard ball yeah. abilities <laughs> and your skills. They were more concerned about whether or not you were the, the right athlete physique um, so that was my heartbreak with AFL but I, I went on and played what I wish had happened to me and I, this was about footy and boxing and what I wish someone told me then was even if you don't play this sport at the most elite levels yeah there's still a really great like you can still be great at it and you can still be doing it at a decent level yeah without having to be the top level elite yeah 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 because what what happened to me with with sports was if I wasn't playing it at the absolute elite level um, then I didn't want to know about it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so during all this time all the sport presumably there's still school Yes. So how was tell me about school? Tell me what was your what was your subjects, all of the things that you did well at? I was a shithead in school. Right. Yes. <laughs> give give me some more. Um so from and you know, my mum whenever we're out and we talk about me in school, um my mum's recollection is that she was called up to the school almost daily. Right. Because I was in trouble for something. Um so from about the age of grade four, so that's about ten years old. I was just constantly in trouble, constantly in trouble. Give us, give us, give us a good story. Okay, I've got a good story. So um, a bunch of kids that I was in primary school with, um, we decided that it would be a good idea to pick up one of our friends and get them to climb through the library window when the school was closed. Right. Just break it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah just break right. it in. Um, he got caught because we left him there. <laughs> um, but again, uh, that's a very, you know, dog shit. vague, vague recollection. So that was like one of the stories. But, you know, we were just all sorts of things, you know, fighting in school, always fighting in school, um, just blatantly cheeky to teachers. Like I was really, you know, some of the stuff now that I recall that I did in class to teachers. Um, it was just a just horrible. I was just <laughs> horror show. I, I was just I was just a cheeky little shit, yeah. basically. Um, and so that went from grade four, ten years old, until um, around about year eleven. So right. that's like seventeen years old. Yeah. And my entire school career then featured two things. Uh, Russell has got behavioural issues. <laughs> And um, he would do so much better if he could just focus on class. And the other recurring theme was, um, Russell is incredibly gifted as a student, and if only he would apply himself more. And what were the subjects, yeah, and we'll get into your career, and obviously you don't get to a position in life as a CEO without being smart. So were there subjects that you found particularly rewarding or particularly easy? In earlier, I was like I was good at most subjects that I did. So everything from English to maths. Right. Um, I fell out of love with maths, maybe sort of like mid high school, I think. Um, but before that, I was pretty um, I was pretty good at maths. Right. Um, but I was always good at languages, not languages, but English, social sciences, um, 
they were the subjects that I generally liked to do more. Okay. Yeah. And just we'll stick with the school for a while. Mm. You went on to university? I did. So, um, like I said before, most of my mates um, left school and became tradesmen or whatever. So the, the sort of group of kids that I went to school with didn't typically go to uni. Um, and my, my sort of friendship group, that's not what people were doing. Um, so yeah, I went to uni. Um, I did a double degree in um, arts psychology and business HR. Yeah. Um, and when I started that, I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, but I realized after the first year of statistics that I no longer wanted to be a psychologist. Um, so yes, yeah, so I went to uni, but I, you know, I, I, this is, I mean, we're jumping around a lot, but yeah. you know, my life got really interesting um, when I was at uni. Um, you know, I've got four kids, four boys, right? Um, and my first son was born when I was just turned twenty-one. So that obviously threw a massive spanner in the works in terms of you know what university meant to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so as you can imagine, trying to study and um, and work part time then, and look after a new baby, and 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 it was a pretty crazy time in my life. I probably wouldn't recommend anybody taking <laughs> the route that that I took. Yeah, yeah. But you came through it all. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, eventually, eventually. So. Um, yeah, sort of, I, I rushed into the workforce um, and I think it was lucky for me that career-wise, I landed on my feet. So you rushed it, what was your, what was your first job? My first ever job or my no, first real job? Uh, come back to your first ever job, but yeah. go to your first, so the, you know, you've just had the baby, you're, you're thinking about... You know, everybody who you've got to support, yep. you get yourself a job, what was that job? My first real job out of uni was um, I got into the job that ended up being my career and that's what I mean by I was, yep. I was fortunate. Um, so I got into recruitment, right. I was a recruitment consultant as my first real job. Yep. Um, I was fortunate that I landed with one of the major global players in that space. Right. Um, who had a fantastic training program. What did they like about you? What do you reckon, what was the, how did you, how did you score that? I mean, I ended up being pretty senior in recruitment jobs later on, and so I know exactly what they liked about me. I was a PhD, but not in the traditional sense of a PhD. I was poor, yeah. hungry, and desperate, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and obviously I had, um, I had done a bunch of things which, you know, with work that showed that I was a little bit entrepreneurial and, you know, I had a bit of hustle, um, a lot of desperation. Yeah. Um, and so I was pretty sure that they could see that I would be someone that would be able to sell and do deals, yeah. um, which uh, turned out to be the case. So I, th I think that's probably, and I, you know, I can remember, you know, I was, I was pretty, um, I was pretty arrogant is probably the term that I would use then. Confident. Confident. Yeah, that's, confident. that's better. Yeah, confident. So I think, you know, I presented myself with all the bravado and confidence that you would need to land a job which requires a lot of bravado and confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And were you still boxing? So were you still doing any sort of sport at that, at that point or did sport take a bit of a backseat? Yeah, so boxing for me was um, late teens. I had a bunch of mates who I played footy with who were doing um, boxing sort of pre-season stuff. Yeah. And that's how I got into boxing. Was there much crossover from your previous martial art, or was the stance very different? Or? Uh, um, well, the first style of boxing that I learned, not so much. I'm, I learned more of a sort of back foot defensive style of boxing, was right. the first style that I learned. Um, so there's a, the, a gym in Heidelberg in um, Melbourne, which is also a pretty rough and tumble yep. kind of area, or it used to be. Um, there was a gym there called Bobby Dunn's Gym, um, which uh, the blog that had that initially of the namesake, he was a WBC world champion. I can't remember exactly what weight class. His son-in-law took the gym over, but they used to teach quite a defensive back foot kind of style. 
Um, so that was very different to what I'd learned previously. Right. Um, and so, you know, I trained and um, had, a, had some competitions, like inter-club competitions and all of that sort of stuff as I was progressing through. But boxing for me at that stage in my life was kind of just a, it was like an aside. Like right. I was, you know, footy was still my main sport. There was a bunch of guys that I'd sort of played with and trained with. And so I was just doing that. I didn't think that I was, like it wasn't really my sport. Right. You know, but I did it and I did it for quite a few years. And that was sort of my initial experience in boxing itself. And then I kind of, over the years, I went to a few different gyms with a few other people and all of that sort of stuff. But it was never really like, that wasn't my sport, right? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. another combat sport that I'd done, but I was still, you know, footy was still my main thing. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, you know, when the job happened and, you know, uni and kid and all of that sort of stuff, as you could imagine, um, sports for me went very much by the wayside. Yeah. Um, and so it was then just sort of head down and focus on trying to have a career and try and, you know, make something of myself, yeah. um, which is what I thought my career would, would help me be able to do. Well, now we're on the career, we'll come back to the boxing because mm. obviously that's going to be a hot topic for everybody who's watching. But in terms of that career, mm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a little bit about, you start out as a recruitment consultant, yep. part of a, a team. Yep. Um, tell us about the progression and, and where that ended you up in mm. life. Yeah, so like I said before, I think I was fortunate that that, that was really like my first ever job. Uh, well, not my first ever job, sorry, my first real job. Yeah. Um, so the training program in the company that I worked for was known to be sort of one of the best in the world. Yeah. So that was, you know, um, world class went through that training program. And then what I found out about um, recruitment as a recruitment consultant in an agency like that you know, it's a sales job, yep. right? You, your your worth is defined by the fees that you can generate. The byproduct is you help people with their careers and you help um, clients find great people. But really the core focus of this job was sell, produce fees and get paid good commissions, yep. right? Um, so I remember, here's the, the interesting story, the, my first, year's salary um, the basic salary was something like I'm going to say it was like 22 grand or something annual right. salary yeah um, but they said to me in commissions if you're good in commissions you can do like I can't remember exactly what the figure was it was like they said in commission you could probably do like 50 grand yeah right if you're good yeah and so I remember when I got into that job I got really obsessed with it and I was like alright so if they're telling me this is what I need to do, you know, KPIs, work output, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you're good, you'll get to that. I said, I'm gonna do more than anyone else does. Um, and therefore I should be able to do better. Yeah. And so I was obsessed with it. You know, I'd go out on a run and I'd be thinking to myself, all right, they told me I'm gonna make 50 grand, I'm gonna make 65 grand, right? If they're telling me I've gotta do 30 calls, I'm gonna do 45 calls, yeah. right? That was my mentality going into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and, and the, the company that I worked for, they encouraged that, yeah. right? They encouraged like high output KPIs, KPIs, KPIs. So that was the environment that I grew up in, in recruitment, and in my first year, I exceeded what they said that you would do if you were good in year one. Um, and so they acknowledged that and then I went on a career fast track. Um, so I went from recruitment consultant to senior recruitment consultant to a section manager which is basically looking after a small bunch of people in a particular area. Um, and then I started looking after um, specialised business units um, and the area that I got into was logistics, supply chain and procurement. Right. And that's what I did for my entire recruitment career. I became uh, an expert in procurement and supply chain as a specialization within recruitment. And was it recruitment that eventually got you to Asia? It was recruitment that got me to Asia, yeah. Same firm? Or was um, no, so I did my first seven years um, was with the first company that I worked for. Yeah. And then I, and so I ended up managing a team over there of about 25 consultants. Yeah. I think so it was a, Pretty, pretty good growth over seven years. Then I moved to another company 
um, in Oz as well, and that was a bit bigger remit. Um, and so I built up a big business with those guys. Um, and it was with those guys that I had the opportunity to come to Singapore. Yeah. Um, so I got transferred to come over and I took over their Singapore business, which was supposed to be Singapore and then that ended up being the region for them. Yeah. yeah. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Okay. Feels like an interview. Ah, it's good. Uh, you know, <laughs> Feels like I'm a job interview. I'm bringing back the recruitment. Uh, recruitment yeah. <laughs> so look, you keep telling us about this wasn't your first job. Mm. Tell us some of those other jobs. Up on that. Tell, tell us some of the other jobs you did. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually very proud of the, the work that I've done. Yeah. Even the shitty jobs. Fire away. So my first ever job was I was a kitchen hand at Pizza Hut. Yeah. So I was a dish pig. Right, and I worked there. My sister got a job there first, um, and in Australia, I can't remember what the legal age of working it was, but it was something like fifteen or fourteen years and nine months. Yeah, and at exact that at that point when I was legally allowed to work, I got my sister to get me a job. Right, um, and so I started at Pizza Hut. I was a kitchen hand. I ended up working for Pizza Hut um, in total. Um, over a couple of branches for about seven years, seven right. or eight years. Um, and I started as a dish pig and I ended up being a, a restaurant manager nice. um, over a period of time. But I was doing that and a lot of other jobs. So jobs I've had, I've, uh, I've worked at Pizza Hut. Um, I had another job that I was very proud of um, throughout uni um, where we used to run um, recreational programs for adults who had intellectual disabilities. Yep. And I did that because of the psychology link. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I wanted to be around um, that sort of infrastructure in the mental health care system. Um, and I did that for about four years or so, I think, yep. with that company. Um, some of the, the other jobs that I've done, which were good learning experiences, but I, I don't know if I'd recommend them. I've been a builder's labourer before. Um, so working on building sites, digging yeah. holes in the heat. Yeah. Um, I've worked in a door manufacturing fa factory, yeah. which as you can imagine all day, they make doors, <laughs> right? It's not the most intellectually stimulating of jobs for me anyways. Yeah. Yeah. There's people out there that love it, I'm sure. That was, that was tough. Um, what else have I done in terms of, of jobs? I, I've done um, a couple of startups. Yeah. Um, I did a really interesting business for a while, again when I was at uni, complete startup with a business that were trying to document people's insurance goods. So if you had a house and you had this TV and you had it insured, you had to prove that you had that TV. Oh, yeah. So we came up with a company that helped people document that stuff, oh, so yeah. you know, take photos of it. Um, it didn't end up going anywhere, but it was a startup. Good idea. Was, it wasn't my idea, but I was part of trying to launch it and get it off the ground. Um, what else have I done? As I was, I was at I think at my my peak when I was at uni and doing everything. I was working as a tutor, English tutor yeah. for primary school aged kids. I was working at Pizza Hut. I was working at the leisure, the recreation. Um, thing um, all at once so I was just plus trying to play some sport and all that kind of stuff wow so it's a handful handful well look let's let's move into the boxing mm. so you said that you know boxing was just part of everything you were doing footy was your main thing then footy takes a back seat when did boxing for you become more than just a part-time thing yeah, you, you tell us a little bit about when boxing became serious for you. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your boxing career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like I said before, when I was younger, I was really not anything to know. Like I was just someone who boxed, and I had had an opportunity to have a few competitions, and you know. But it was like I said, it was nothing to write home about, right? Yeah. Um, and and then I stopped. So I probably at the first part, it was. You know, I was doing it, but it wasn't really something that I thought would be anything that I would ever do. But obviously, I'd always had an interest in combat sports, and then that became boxing. Yep. Um, and then I kind of then I stopped. Right, I didn't. I stopped all sports from mid twenties until um, thirty. Right. 
So maybe a bit of gym and some running in between, but I did, I did no sport for that period of time. Okay. Um, and then to answer your question, when boxing got serious for me, which still seems like yesterday, but if I think about it, it's not. When boxing got serious for me again was when I moved from Melbourne to Singapore, I had a whole heap of personal stuff that was going on, which was part of the driver that made me want to move to Singapore. Right, I think we can all relate to that. Right, yep. um, you know, a lot of people that move away from home, there's usually quite a few. Yep. Right. So there was a lot of really heavy things going on in my life. Yep. Right, really heavy things. Um, and when I decided to move to Singapore, one of the things that I said to myself was, I'm going to get back to boxing and combat sports. Um, and so when I moved here, one of the first things that I did was I went and found a gym and I started training again. Um, and then I got serious about that training and then I wanted to compete again. And so then, um, you know, uh, there wasn't really at that stage, so this is about 12 years ago now. Okay. 12 or 13 years ago. Yeah. And at that stage, um, I wasn't familiar with the Singapore boxing scene. The gym that I was at wasn't really connected to the Singapore boxing scene at all. Right. Um, and so I spoke to my coach at that stage, I said, I want to fight. And he said, okay, no worries, we'll send you over to Thailand and you can just fight under professional rules. Okay. <laughs> so just, so essentially turn pro, right? I mean, it's not pro in the sense that you're, you know, you're out there, I mean, you're not like fighting, world champions or anything like that but it was that's how I sort of started and so then my second go at it I, I ended up having uh, four professional fights after 30 right which kept me active kept me doing weight cuts are these including the ones in Singapore though? including the ones in Singapore right. yeah so it kept me kept me doing weight cuts kept me in the gym right um, and so I just kind of made a habit to do a fight every year or year and a half keep myself fit and keep myself involved in it right and so that's that was how sort of boxing revamped itself in my life and then the gym that I was at then um, there was a bunch of guys who were sort of coming through the boxing teams guys who I still uh, know very well now um, so um, Valco and Valvin these guys who are still involved in Spartans now yeah um, they were all training with me right um, and they were only young kids then, and so saw those guys develop. Um, and yeah, at, at that stage again, you know, I would uh, the Singapore boxing scene. Whether it was just because I was unfamiliar with it, but it was also there just wasn't a lot of there wasn't as nowhere near as much happening in the scene then as what there is now. Um, and in two thousand and fifteen, um, I was. I spoke to a friend of mine and said, hey, you know, I've been doing more more coaching. Yep. Um, and so you're know, still recruiting at this point. I've still got, my, still, yeah. still got the corporate job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the corporate job was my thing that I was doing and the yeah. boxing was kind of, you know, the thing that I was doing on yeah. the side. Um, and it was a hobby and a passion of mine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I spoke to a buddy of mine and I said, um, you know, look, I want to go out and maybe like do some more coaching. Yeah. And he said, I've got a mate. So the buddy of mine, shout out to Simon Triggs, Triggsy, because um, he was kind of the thing that made this whole Spartans thing happen for me. Right. Um, Simon had done a white collar boxing fight right. in 2012. Yep. Or 2014, I can't remember. And I had trained him for that fight. On that white collar card, um, was Nas Musa. Oh, right, okay. So he and Simon, and also Victor Meningo. Oh, really? They were all on that same white-collar boxing card in Singapore. Okay. Do you want right. to, do you want to just for the uninitiated, do you want to let people know who those names are? Yeah, so 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 Simon Triggs, as I said, good buddy of mine, um, was involved in the white-collar boxing scene in Singapore for quite a while. Um, one of my best mates. Uh, Nas Musa is the founder of Spartans Boxing Club, who is today our chairman and founder and, and my business partner in this, this whole thing. 
uh, and Victor Meningo is um, one of our partners in our newly established Philippine Spartans business. Yeah. So the power of community wow. through boxing, yeah. which is one of the things that we love to talk about, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's it right there for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's that, that's who's who in the zoo. Yeah. Um, so you know, Simon makes an introduction and says, "Oh, you've got to meet Nas. He's just opened a gym." Um, and uh, you know, I went and met Nas at Spartans Jew Chef, and it right. had just been opened. Right. And um, you know, apparently Nas needed some some trainers, some part time trainers. So I walked in and I met Nas, and I remember in the first conversation, I walked into Jew Chef. It wasn't as nice as what it is now. I walked in and I said, oh, mate, this gym's lovely. You know, I'd love to have something like this one day back in Australia. You know, that's part of, right. you know, the, part of the, the, the retirement plan or yeah. the side gig or whatever it was. And the conversation, I can't remember the exact details, but it went something along the lines of, Nas goes, yeah, I need a business partner. Would you be interested? We ended up doing, doing a deal. And that quick. Pretty much that quick. Wow, fantastic! And it was good timing because shortly after that, Nas landed a big gig in Sydney, in Australia. Right. Um, and he needed to. He left. Yeah. And so I was kind of here, and we had a team in the first gym. Yeah. But I was essentially, you know, the role of what we would now call a franchise owner. Yeah. Um, I was the guy that was responsible for the overall happening. So you're running due chair. You've got your you've got your recruitment stuff going on at the same time. You're juggling. You're juggling both. Yeah. At what point did you say, hey, I need a little bit more on my plate and uh, I'm going to turn this into a franchise? Um, so there's a, more, there's a more interesting part of the story there. Yeah. So at exactly the same time in 2015, so I had my comfortable corporate recruitment gig. So yeah. I was managing director of the region. I had about 65 people wow. in that business that were reporting to me across a few different countries. I decided that I didn't want to do the corporate gig anymore. And, and what was, um, t t t tell me that. So you decide, what was the thinking there? Because that's a big call. The thinking for me was, in, it was really about career and enjoyment of the job. Right. And I ended up managing a business where I stopped doing all of the things that I loved. Right. Like I love being in front of clients. I love doing deals. I mean, yeah. you, you work with me, right? That, yeah. That's that's what gets me up in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what I ended up doing in that role was I was doing a lot of administration, and I just wasn't doing the stuff that lit my fire. Yeah. Um, and so at that stage, I had a business plan that I'd written um, for a startup recruitment business specialising in the particular area that I was. Uh, specialised in procurement, procurement and supply chain, and I so I approached some guys in Australia and said, "Hey, you've got that part of the business. I've got this part of the business. What do you think?" Yeah, and we did a start up here in Singapore. Nice. Um, and so that's that business is still around today. I stepped out of that in two thousand and nineteen. Right. Which is the point in time where I decided that Spartans was. This is where I wanted to go with my career, and this is where the opportunity is really at. And just to backtrack, um, it was 2017 when Nas and I decided that the Spartans business was really special. You know, we we set out with the objective of having a community boxing gym in the community for the community, making it accessible to people that may have never thought about stepping into a boxing gym women, kids, non-fighters, you know, just the average job off the street. Um, but also making sure that it was authentic. Um, and we were successful with that. And the key business drivers we were also pretty successful with. You know, the sort of stuff that we talk to franchise owners now about. Yeah. You know, um, fast payback periods, cash flow positive, profitability and all that kind of stuff. So um, we decided in 2017 that we wanted to expand. And was that was that a hard, you know, you've got a, I won't say a cushy gig, but you've got a you've got a corporate job which you've worked your career for, you've you've, you know, a lot of people just said you've made it, and then to step back from that mm -hmm. into essentially a startup, yeah, you know, at that point you've got one gym, yeah, you your understanding of franchising would have been limited. Oh, this is nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, was that was that a, a long process of? sort of thinking and yeah. then you just went, okay, I've got to go for this. 
That's, look, that's a great question. And I think, you know, I, I'm really fortunate, and I've said this a lot, and I'll say it again, I'm really fortunate that I've been able to work with Nas over the years. Like, I was fortunate to land with him back then when I did. When we decided in 2000, I think we opened the second gym in 2018, which was our first franchise, but it was a very rough cut version of what we're doing now. Um, but Nas and I started talking then that, that I w maybe wanted to pursue this boxing business as a full-time thing. But between deciding that we wanted to expand, opening the second gym, and then me actually taking the plunge and doing it and stepping into Spartans, I didn't do that until late 2019. Right. So there was a period of time that Nas and I were sort of discussing, okay, if this is really what you want to do, how do you make that transition? Right. Um, you've got a family and you need to make some money and blah, 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 blah. So it was, a, I think, pretty well thought out and planned process and we made sure that the timing was right. right. Although shortly after we thought the timing was right and I stepped out and went into Spartans full time, which was October 2019. Right, I know what's coming. We opened the third and fourth gyms early 2020. Right. And then the pandemic hit. Right. Um, so How the timing couldn't have been, oh, I mean, petrifying. Yeah. Absolutely petrifying. So, um, yeah, I mean, I thought... Yeah, I think I would have met you just before the... Before, like, I think before, you would have met, yeah, correct. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just just anxiety at the highest levels. <laughs> yep. Um, but, you know, I've got a, I've got, I guess, a philosophy, not just in business, but also in life. You know, if you're in a position where things are difficult, you either got to lie down or you got to get up and just fight. Yeah. Um, and so that's exactly what we did when the pandemic hit, and we were smart about the way that we positioned the business throughout the pandemic. I think we did all of the right things, leaning into our values about community. In the end, the pandemic was a blessing for our business. We got to do a lot of the stuff that we needed to do to be able to scale. Yeah. You know, we digitized, we really sat down and refined the model again. As you know, that step change, yep. right? We never stop perfecting the model. Yep. Um, but that's kind of what we did. But it was a, it was a really, really scary moment in my career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got through that. And now you're at now you're at this stage, and I'm, I'm conscious of time. It's just, they always say this, right? This is one of those ones that will lead around too, I'm sure. Yeah. But look, bring us up to now. You've you've, you've got through that, and now Spartans is this fast growing franchise. Is it where you want it to be? Is it where you thought it would be? Is it what? I mean, where's your thinking with respect to where you are now and what the future holds? Mm, that's a really good question. I have to remind myself often to step back and look at what this business is. Like, it's a great business, I really love it. Right? Everybody, anybody that knows me knows that I'm completely passionate about this mission that we're on, yeah. right? And if I wasn't, you'd have to worry, right? Um, so I, I love this business, I think we're doing incredible things, I think the outlook is incredibly bright. Um, if I were to assess, Sometimes I think we've gone slower than what I would have liked. But at the same time, I think there's so much evidence around for steady and sustainable growth. I would choose that now, any day, yeah. over you know being a flash in the pan. Um, so you, know, you and I talk about this a lot. There's a lot of examples of businesses that we admire where steady and sustainable is really the, the you know, that's the thing that you should be going for. Yeah. Um, so, you know, without the odd, like, oh, geez, I wish we were, you know, 10 times bigger and I wish we'd move faster then, I think we're around about where we need to be. I'm really, really proud of what this business looks like now. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, and it's been organic, and I think for me that's the thing that is really encouraging. Like, we set out to create something that was unique in this space. Like you said before, we knew nothing about franchising, we knew nothing about boutique fitness, now we know that's the space that we're in. Yeah. We're experts in that space now. So, you know, in terms of where where the business is at, um, you know, I, I just think that it's a great business and it's unique and it's grown organically. And um, 
what we're doing now and the people that we've got and just where we're at, I'm very, very excited about the, what the future holds, absolutely. And what does that future hold? When you look at it, when you look at it, you know, five years from now, what, you know, you've, this has been your vision, you've, uh, you've done incredibly well, but it feels like it's just starting. Mm. So what is that vision? I mean, you know, that's obviously what the viewers want to know. They, they, it's yeah. rare that we get this opportunity to sit down with the CEO who's taken it from where we go. Mm. Yeah, so I mean the business, as I said, it's it's sort of, we, we set out to create something that was unique and that almost became a double-edged sword. Yep. Um, and so what we've been able to do with this business now is we've really been able to capture, you know, the key areas of what the business is about. Um, so the key areas of this business now are the franchise gyms, yep. you know, Spartans Boxing Clubs, um, our events, which is our white collar boxing events. Um, and our Spartan Boxing Academy, which is the education arm of the business. And each one of those parts of the business is unique in its own right. Um, all of those areas of business can become their own standalone businesses in all of the markets that we operate in. Yep. Um, and so, you know, the mission is to have gyms, events, and academy operating as at least one of the top three um, in their markets wherever we go. Um, and underpinning that with all of our technology and concepts like Spartan's Mind, you know, these are their enablers of what this business is all about. Um, but, you know, those three pillars is what we're really about expanding now. And so, you know, to get into the sort of nitty gritty of it, you know, we're now with the gyms, we're in, um, you know, we're in Singapore, 12 gyms, we've got three to come in Dubai, we're into Philippines now, Australia looks like it's gonna crack open again soon. Um, other countries around the region, Middle East as well. Cambodia. Cambodia as well. So, you know, we've got aggressive expansion plans across Asia Pacific and the Middle East in the immediate term with the gyms. Um, so that should keep us pretty busy. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, we've got the white collar boxing events, which we're now also expanding out globally. So, you know, we've got two events this year uh, in Dubai. We've got Abu Dhabi booked now. We've got Singapore, Cambodia on our horizon with the white collar boxing events. We've got Philippines as well. That white collar boxing uh, events business, that will operate events in all countries and all markets that we're in. And we've got a unique infrastructure in that we've got um, a presence of gyms that will come all together to bring white collar events together. Yeah. Um, and then of course there's the academy as well, right? The education arm about enabling people and coaches to be able to really upskill and build proper careers in boxing as a fitness modality. Yeah. Um, you know, that's an area. And what I like most about that infrastructure that I talk about is it's all complementary, yeah. right? You know, the, the gyms create competitors for white collar and you know white collar people might be the next guys to buy a franchise and you know the academy can recruit coaches externally and they may become coaches that are awesome for us or also we might put coaches our coaches through the academy and then they become franchise owners and so it's this really unique infrastructure and and we're just i think what we're doing in the the boxing space and boutique fitness it's just really neat. There's no other space I'd rather be other than this boxing modality, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So, look, I know we're, I'm conscious of time. What, uh, what are the two things that you love about being a CEO? Mm -hmm. What are the two things that you go, oh, I, could, I wish that didn't come with the job? Oh, geez, you put me on the spot with that. Uh, two things that I love. Um, I love telling my wife that she has to call me CEO. No, <laughs> no, 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 that's not, that's not. No, I, the, the role I love in C, as a CEO is I love being able to have the freedom to be able to come up with a vision and then being able to work with great people who either tell you that's crazy, that's ridiculous, can it? Or we get to build something, right? And so being able to take a vision from some harebrained crazy idea and turning it into something that people believe in and that you can operationalize it together, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I love the freedom of being a CEO, so I work wherever and whenever I like. Double-edged sword, one of the things I hate about being a CEO, you're always on, yeah. right? You're always working, um, you're literally 24 seven. 
Um, I mean, that's not just CEO, that's anybody that's an entrepreneur, that's anybody that's got their own business or a startup. Um, so that is, you know, the great thing is I can work from wherever, meaning that, you know, if I decide that I want to go down to Australia and see my family next week, I can. But also, during the time that I'm there, I'm probably going to be on calls the whole time. Yep. Right, so that's probably the part that I dislike. Um, and what's another part about the CEO that I don't miss? I mean, I, I, I generally don't like doing administration and admin will still be my bugbear. Um, and so hopefully one day when we're big enough and I'll have a PA that can do that for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah those, those, those days are coming. Yeah. Okay, well look, uh, in the, for the last question given the time, mm. who ha influences you both from a business perspective and then from a boxing perspective? And you know, so who are, the, who are the people that you look at from a boxing perspective that you know, are your favorites? Who from a business perspective? Again, you put me on the spot. Good questions. Um, okay, boxing. I'll start with boxing. That's yep. easy. Uh, my favourite boxer. Everyone knows this. My favourite boxer is Canelo. Yeah. Um, I just think the the brilliance of Canelo is just just having such basic, solid fundamentals, just done so well. And uh, you know, I, I love that about him. Um, so he's my favorite boxer, but in terms of like, who do I admire as a boxer? This is gonna sound really cheesy. Um, I've watched Fasher's boxing career unfold and take many different turns. And again, for those who might not know, Fash. Fash is my wife. <laughs> um, so Fash has been a professional boxer and also uh, a, a national amateur boxer. She's fought at international competitions. But I've watched her career and I've just, the thing that I have, have, have admired I'm very close to it is just she, the work ethic that goes into it. I'm a huge admirer of work ethic um, and so I really admire and I'm influenced by her relentless work ethic no matter what's happening whether it's good, bad or indifferent. Yep. Um, she always shows up. Um, that's a bit cheesy but that's what it is. Um, and business, jeez. Um, I got, I've got a long list of people who um, I admire. Um, working closely with you, I mean, as much as I don't blow smoke up his ass because it's the <laughs> podcast. It was, not a host, it was a hundred percent lean. Question. No, no. Work, look, working with working with you um, has taught me a lot, um, and I really enjoy that. And I always tell people to work with people who are better at things than you, and you're way better at a lot of things than what I am. Um, so definitely yourself, Nas, absolutely. I've learned so much from Nas over the years um, in terms of being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that they don't tell you about um, being an entrepreneur, you know, he gave me a book once and it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, right. um, which sums up, you know, yeah. this entrepreneurial journey beautifully. Um, you know, other people that we've got involved in the business, Maz, who is one of the owners of one of our gyms, um, Kunal, one of the smartest blokes that I think I've met in business. Like, there's a long list of people, but I'm, the thing I'm most fortunate about is that all of these people who I feel are influential are now the people that I consider to be my, my circle. Um, and I think that's, that's really important, right? They're the people that I want to be around because I'm learning from them. They're a good influence. They're always able to give me perspectives that I don't necessarily have. So that would probably be my main, my main ones. Excellent. Yeah. Well, look, that's been brilliant. I mean, we've gone through your life, we've gone through your sporting career, we've gone through your psychoanalyzed school. <laughs> yeah. We've got you. We've got you psychoanalyzed. We've got you with your boxing. We've talked about your career. Spartans is an incredible journey, mm -hmm. and it's. I mean, what you've achieved is just unbelievable through very difficult times, like yep. we said, through COVID, to get the growth that you got, to be have a platform post-COVID, to now be able to, to strike, it's super exciting. Mm. So, um, obviously wish you all the best and love being part of the team. It's fun uh, being able to sit on this side of the camera and, and, and interview with that. For, for those watching, I hope this gave you a real good insight uh, into the life of our CEO and essentially um, how Spartans has been uh, built and uh, I think that's a wrap for another uh, Spartans uh, community TV. Fantastic.